salutations. Before taking a tangent to talk about the nature of the individual, we wrapped up the triumvirate of the intellectual sphere with the anima mundi. Below this lies the sensible or material sphere of generation, wherein change occurs. But what exactly constitutes the lower sphere? Well, we have those things that we perceive with the senses, which are transient, but we all perceive different things with our senses, and even the same things can appear differently to different subjects. For the establishment of commonalities within the sensible sphere, we have formal consensus, most typified in the scientific method, which produces reliable results through repeatable actions. By this, we map out a layer of material reality by use of the physical faculties. But if you've learned anything from this series so far, it is that human beings possess non-physical faculties of some sort. We must now propose there to be at least one incorporeal layer to this same sphere. This proposition is not arbitrary, in fact it is required to explain the facts presented in the previous videos in this series, particularly to provide a medium and mechanism for certain well-established but intangible phenomena. The type of phenomenon I will be expanding upon here involve the perception of particular entities which behave as if endowed with independent consciousness. I have left a link in the description to a video about how Romans perceived some of these entities. These phenomena, as I hope to demonstrate, are so common, ubiquitous, and strongly consistent in all relevant details that it is no more reasonable to suggest that they are simple hallucinations than it is to say the same thing about commonly accepted physical objects and events. However, it is first necessary to lay out our theory regarding the nature of the entities responsible for these phenomena in order to make predictions that can be falsified after the fashion of a scientific investigation. Bring the coffee. Let's ask the spirits. Chalcidius, in his commentary on Plato's Timaeus, has this to say. Therefore, as the divine and immortal race of beings is dwelling in the region of heaven and the stars, i.e. distant from man, and the temporal and perishable race which is liable to passion inhabits the earth, between these two there must be some intermediate connecting the outermost limits, just as we see in harmony and in the world itself. For as there are intermediates in the elements themselves, which are set between them and join together the body of the whole world in a continuous whole, the different transitional states of energy and matter, thus as there is an immortal being which is impassable and at the same time rational, which is said to be heavenly, and as likewise there exists another mortal being liable to passions, our human race, it must be that there is some intermediate race which partakes both of the heavenly and of the terrestrial nature, and that this race is immortal i.e. non-physical, and liable to passion, i.e. change. That sounds simple enough. We understand from this that these entities are subject to change, and therefore exist within the same sphere of generation that we do, but at the same time they do not possess corruptible physical bodies that are subject to age and decay. Therefore, they must be composed of some other sort of matter that is separate from the physical matter that we can perceive with our five mundane senses. Iamblichus of Syria, in his letter to Porphyry, distinguishes daimons thusly. Hence, the essence of daimons is effective, and perfective of mundane natures, and gives completion to the superintendence of generated individuals, i.e. particulars. It follows, therefore, that in the next place we should define the energies of them. Those of the daimons, indeed, must be surveyed as occupied about the world, i.e. the sphere of generation, and more widely extended in their effects. So we see that they are below the sphere of universals, as all of their capacities relate to particulars and to change. By all this, we understand there to be a landscape of various interacting bodies separate from the physical one. Various people have attributed all kinds of different explanations to this, dubbing this landscape and the constituting bodies with such monikers as Astral Plane, Other World, Spirit World, and Etheric Plane. All we know is that some very weird stuff happens there. I shall tentatively assign to it the label of subtle matter and use derivatives of this for clarity. We must strongly maintain that this subtle matter and all its structures are both transient and material, just like their physical equivalents. If it makes it easier to comprehend, you can envision two different dimensions that exist alongside one another and do not interact directly, but between which pre-material pneuma and conscious experience can be exchanged. I mean, where the what the f what frickin' dimension is this little creature from? Plato describes subtle matter in terms of both fire the fire rises and air. In the Timaeus, fire signifies radiant energy such as light and heat, and air signifies anything in a plasmic or gaseous state. 
These are the analogies used to describe subtle matter or aether, which is distinguished specifically from physical gases such as the atmosphere, which he called hygra usia. We also see from the following that they are able to manifest phasmata, or subjective visions of themselves to those who are receptive to them. These are also variable, but they represent the inner nature of the daimon in some manner. I conclude that their appearances accord with their essences, powers, and energies. The phasmata, or luminous appearances of the gods are uniform, those of daimons are various and those of daimons are at different times seen in a different form, and appear at one time great, but at another petty, but are still recognised as the phasmata of daimons. So in looking for evidence, our focus will not be on a uniformity of accidents, but on a uniformity of impressions and behaviours. Examples of impressions would be perceived size, association with specific places or environments, types of abilities, characteristics of a certain group of animals, etc. For this demonstration, I have collected all the references I could find to certain types of entities and thrown away any that have contradictory traits so that only the ones that definitely match the specific criteria I'm looking for remain. If these experiences are caused by real entities and are not just culture-bound folk tales, then the places and times in which they are described should not correspond to particular cultural regions. They should also not be confined to certain time periods, and examples should be discoverable from both ancient folklore and modern encounters. In the future, I may make videos exploring all the more common types, but for the sake of evidence, I believe three will suffice. And remember, this is just the result of me personally scouring the internet and a couple of books for what I can find. A team of researchers could probably dig up a thousand times more examples than I have here. The first type of entity we will be looking for are described as small in stature, usually male, and as dwelling in a world that is spatially separated from that of humans usually underground in hills, mountains, or burial mounds. Many stories involve them taking humans into their world, and sometimes replacing them, and the humans experiencing the passage of time differently from those they leave behind. And there's something about this fairy... So, we are looking for descriptions of male humanoids who are exceptionally small in size, who occupy a separate world or land from humans, particularly an underground one, and who are strongly associated with a perceived transition from ordinary reality into a separate one, accompanied by a distortion in the subjective passage of time. I will leave out any reports from Sub-Saharan Africa, because descriptions of diminutive humanoids could be explained by human tribes of small stature. And here's the result. As you can see, these reports transcend all cultural boundaries. As for contemporary reports, Hello, me old chum. you will find plenty of references to duendes in Latin America where people still hold traditional beliefs, but what about the materialist progressive West? Well, of course, nobody around here ever reports stories of short, masculine entities abducting humans and leaving them with a distorted sense of the passage of time, do they? This alone could all be a massive, gigantic coincidence, of course, so let's move on. The second type of entities I will examine are described as giant, hairy, and brutish. They are carnivorous, cruel, and terrifying to see, and they have a very strong aversion to thunder and heavy rain, being depicted in mythology as enemies of the gods that control the weather. So we're looking for descriptions of giant, bestial humanoids, monstrous and frightening, which are averse to storms. I will again be avoiding Sub-Saharan Africa, because any story about a large, hairy, man-like creature could be explained by gorillas. And here's the result. Just like before, you can see that they appear everywhere, without any regard for human cultures and belief systems. As for modern reports, there are entire television shows that revolve around the huge numbers of people who claim to have seen such entities. Our final type of entity belongs to the water. Specifically, they all belong to particular bodies of water which they remain close to. They are usually female and are capable of enthralling, enchanting, or hypnotizing humans who sometimes end up drowned as a result. So, we're looking for descriptions of female humanoids that are associated with particular bodies of water and the surrounding areas, and have the ability to enthrall or hypnotize humans which are commonly associated with drownings. And here's the result. 
this time I did include Sub-Saharan Africa because this description is so specific that there is no material explanation possible anywhere in the world. As for modern accounts, I found news reports of encounters from the 21st century, as well as multiple pages made by Christians claiming to have encountered them, which refer to these entities as marine demons. These are demons. I encourage you to try this for yourself. You will discover that if you do it with a general category of being that's been spoken of since ancient times, you will get positive results. Whereas if you do it with some monster from modern folklore with a definite origin, or a unique creature from a specific legend, you won't get very far. You may have noticed that the latter of the species I've presented is tied to physical locations. There are many others which are bound to physical objects or places, such as trees, stones, rivers, mountains and hills. Hello, Pench boy. What you do in these woods? The generic Latin term for this is genius loci. The Germanic term is landwites or landwetir. White meaning a sentient being of any sort. Another distinguishing factor among various daimons is their temperament. A eudaimon is a benevolent daimon in service of a higher power, akin to the Abrahamic notion of guardian angels, while a kakadaimon is an evil spirit akin to the Abrahamic notion of demons. These entities exert influence over terrestrial matters, for good or ill, depending on how they are treated by humans. Those with a deep-seated respect for the natural world may find the land whites as friends and allies, while those who are antagonistic may find themselves irrationally haunted by the wilderness. For anyone interested, I will leave a link in the description to a video about land whites from a modern Germanic heathen. But how are they able to exert influence upon physical beings like us? The answer is simple, that we too possess a subtle presence that can mutually interact with others. This is not a novel idea, it is common to virtually every culture on Earth, from shamanistic traditions to Buddhism, and everything in between. It is also a necessary mechanism to explain the parapsychological phenomena that we explored in previous videos, and there is no alternative model that explains that huge body of scientific evidence. You have heard me and some of the people I've quoted in these videos mention God several times now, and you might be wondering how such a concept fits into everything we've discussed so far. Fear not, for in the next video we will be covering the topic of divinity. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. The type of phenomenon I will be expanded on. Blech. The type of phenomenon I. Phenomenon. The type of phenomenon I will be expanding upon here. Blech.